Chapter 7 of Book 1 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marin Todorov. Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hepgood. Book 1. Waterloo. Chapter 7. Napoleon in a Good Humor. The Emperor, though ill and discommoded on horseback by a local travel, had never been in a better humor than on that day. His impenetrability had been smiling ever since the morning. On the 18th of June, that profound soul masked by marble beamed blindly. The man, who had been gloomy at Austerlitz, was gay at Waterloo. The greatest favourites of destiny make mistakes. Our joys are composed of shadow. The supreme smile is God's alone. Ridet César, Pompeius Flebet, said the legionnaires of the Fulminatrix Legion. Pompey was not destined to weep on that occasion, but it is certain that Caesar laughed. While exploring on the horseback at one o'clock on the preceding night in storm and rain, in company with Bertrand, the communes in the neighborhood of Rosson, satisfied at the sight of the long line of English campfires illuminating the whole horizon from Frichemont to brain la it had seemed to him that fate, to whom he had assigned a day on the field of Waterloo, was exact to the appointment. He stopped his horse, and remained for some time motionless, gazing at the lightning and listening to the thunder. And this fatalist was heard to cast into the darkness this mysterious saying, We are in accord. Napoleon was mistaken. They were no longer in accord. He took not a moment for sleep. Every instant of that night was marked by a joy for him. He traversed the line of the principal outposts, halting here and there to talk to the sentinels. At half past two, near the wood of Hogemont, he heard the thread of a column on the march. He thought at the moment that it was a retreat on the part of Wellington. He said, It is the rear guard of the English getting under way for the purpose of decamping. I will take prisoners the 6,000 English who have just arrived at Ostend. He conversed expansively. He regained the animation which he had shown at his landing on the 1st of March when he pointed out to the Grand Marshal, the enthusiastic peasant of Gulf Juan, and cried, Well, Bertrand, here is a reinforcement already. On the night of the 17th to the 18th of June, he rallied Wellington. That little Englishman needs a lesson, said Napoleon. The rain redoubled in violence. The thunder rolled while the emperor was speaking. At half past three o'clock in the morning, he lost one illusion. Officers who had been dispatched to reconnoitre announced to him that the enemy was not making any movement. Nothing was stirring. Not a bivouac fire had been extinguished. The English army was asleep. The silence on earth was profound. The only noise was in the heavens. At four o'clock, a peasant was brought in to him by the scouts. This peasant had served as guide to a brigade of English cavalry, probably Vivian's brigade, which was on its way to take up a position in the village of Orhain, at the extreme left. At five o'clock, two Belgian deserters reported to him that they had just quitted their regiment and that the English army was ready for battle. So much the better, exclaimed Napoleon. I prefer to overthrow them rather than to drive them back. In the morning, he dismounted in the mud on the slope which forms an angle with the Placenois road, had a kitchen table and a peasant's chair brought to him from the farm of Rosson, seated himself with a truss of straw for a carpet and spread out on the table the chart of the battlefield, saying to Saul, as he did so, a pretty checkerboard. In consequence of the rains during the night, the transports of provisions embedded in the soft roads had not been able to arrive by morning. 
The soldiers had had no sleep. They were wet and fasting. This did not prevent Napoleon from exclaiming cheerfully to Ney, We have 90 chances out of a hundred. At eight o'clock, the emperor's breakfast was brought to him. He invited many generals to it. During breakfast, it was said that Wellington had been to a ball two nights before, in Brussels, at the Duchess of Richmond's. And so, a rough man of war, with a face of archbishop, said, The ball takes place today. The emperor jested with Ney, who said, Wellington will not be so simple as to wait for your majesty. That was his way, however. He was fond of jesting, says Fleury de Chaboulon. A merry humor was at the foundation of his character, says Gorgot. He abounded in pleasantries, which were more peculiar than witty, says Benjamin Constant. These gaieties of a giant are worthy of insistence. It was he who called his grenadiers his grumblers. He pinched their ears, he pulled their moustaches. The emperor did nothing but play pranks on us, is the remark of one of them. During the mysterious trip from the island of Elba to France on the 27th of February, on the open sea, the French brig of war Le Zephyr, having encountered the brig L'Inconstant, on which Napoleon was concealed, and having asked the news of Napoleon from L'Inconstant, the emperor, who still wore in his hat the white and amaranthine cockade sewn with bees, which he had adopted at the Isle of Elba, laughingly seized the speaking trumpet and answered for himself, The emperor is well. A man who laughs like that is on familiar terms with events. Napoleon indulged in many fits of this laughter during the breakfast at Waterloo. After breakfast, he meditated for a quarter of an hour. Then two generals seated themselves on the truss of straw, pen in hand, and their paper on their knees, and the emperor dictated to them the order of battle. At nine o'clock, at the instant when the French army, ranged in echelons and set in motion in five columns, had deployed, the divisions in two lines, the artillery between the brigades, the music at their head, as they beat the march with rolls on the drums and the blasts of trumpets, mighty, vast, joyous, a sea of casks, of sabres, and of bayonets on the horizon, the emperor was touched and twice exclaimed, Magnificent! Magnificent! Between nine o'clock and half past ten, the whole army, incredible as it may appear, had taken up its position and raged itself in six lines, forming, to repeat the emperor's expression, the figure of six Vs. A few moments after the formation of the battle array, in the midst of that profound silence, like that which heralds the beginning of a storm which precedes engagement, the emperor tapped Hex on the shoulder as he beheld the three batteries of twelve pounders, detached by his order from the corps of Erlon, Reil, and Labo, and destined to begin the action by taking Mont Saint Jean, which was situated at the intersection of the Nivelle and the Genappe roads, and said to him, There are four and twenty handsome maids, General. Sure of the issue, he encouraged with a smile, as they passed before him, the company of sappers of the first corps, which he had appointed to the barricade Mont-Saint-Jean as soon as the village should be carried. All this serenity had been traversed by but a single word of haughty pity, perceiving on his left, at a spot where there now stands a large tomb, those admirable Scotch grace, with their superb horses massing themselves, he said, it is a pity. Then he mounted his horse, advanced beyond Rosson, and selected for his post of observation a contracted elevation of turf to the right of the road from Genappe to Brussels, which was his second station during the battle. The third station, the one adopted at seven o'clock in the evening between La Belle Alliance and La Haye Saint, is formidable. It is a rather elevated knoll which still exists and behind which the guard was massed on a slope of the plain. Around this knoll the balls rebounded from the pavements of the road 
up to Napoleon himself. As at Brienne, he had over his head the shriek of the bullets and of the heavy artillery. Moldy cannonballs, old sword blades and shapeless projectiles, eaten up with rust, were picked up at the spot where his horse feet stood. Scabra Rubigine. A few years ago, a shell of 60 pounds, still charged and with its fuse broken off level with the bomb, was unearthed. It was at this last post that the emperor said to his guide, Lacoste, a hostile and terrified peasant, who was attached to the saddle of a hussar and who turned round at every discharge of canister and tried to hide behind Napoleon. Fool, it is shameful. You'll get yourself killed with a bull in the back. He who writes these lines has himself found in the frable soil of this knoll, on turning over the sand, the remains of the neck of a bomb disintegrated by the oxidization of six and forty years, and all fragments of iron which parted like elder twigs between the fingers. Everyone is aware that the variously inclined indulations of the plains, where the engagement between Napoleon and Wellington took place, are no longer what they were on June 18th, 1815. By taking from this mournful field the wherewithal to make a monument to it, its real relief has been taken away, and history, disconcerted, no longer finds her bearings there. It has been disfigured for the sake of glorifying it. Wellington, when he beheld Waterloo once more, two years later, exclaimed, they have altered my field of battle. Where the great pyramid of earth, surmounted by the lion, rises today, there was a hillock which descended in an easy slope towards the Nivelle Road, but which was almost an escarpment on the side of the highway to Genappe. The elevation of this escarpment can still be measured by the height of the two knolls of the two great sepulchres which enclose the road from Genappe to Brussels. One, the English tomb, is on the left. The other, the German tomb, is on the right. There is no French tomb. The whole of that plain is a sepulchre for France. Thanks to the thousands upon thousands of cartloads of earth employed in the hillock, 150 feet in height and half a mile in circumference, the plateau of Mont Saint-Jean is now accessible by an easy slope. On the day of battle, particularly on the side of La Haye Saint, it was abrupt and difficult of approach. The slope there is so steep that the English cannon could not see the farm situated in the bottom of the valley, which was the center of the combat. On the 18th of June, 1815, the rains had still farther increased this acclivity. The mud complicated the problem of the ascent, and the men not only slipped back, but stuck fast in the mire. Along the crest of the plateau ran a sort of trench, whose presence it was impossible for the distant observer to divine. What was this trench? Let us explain. Brienne la Lotte is a Belgian village, Orhen is another. These villages, both of them concealed in curves of the landscape, are connected by a road about a league and a half in length, which traverses the plain along its indulating level and often enters and buries itself in the hills like a furrow, which makes a ravine of this road in some places. In 1815, as at the present day, this road cut the crest of the plateau of Mont Saint-Jean between the two highways from Genappe and Nivelle, only it is now on a level with the plain. It was then a hollow way. Its two slopes have been appropriated for the monumental hillock. This road was, and still is, a trench throughout the greater portion of its course. A hollow trench, sometimes a dozen feet in depth, and whose banks, being too steep, crumbled away here and there, particularly in winter, under driving rains. Accidents happened here. The road was so narrow at the brain la Lude entrance that a passerby was crushed by a cart, as is provided by a stone cross which stands near the cemetery, and which gives the name of the dead, Monsieur Bernard de Brier, merchant of Brussels, and the date of the accident, February 1637. 
it was so deep on tableland on Mont Saint-Jean that a peasant, Matthieu Nices, was crushed there in 1783 by a slide from the slope, as is stated on another stone cross, the top of which has disappeared in the process of clearing the ground, but whose overturned pedestal is still visible on the grassy slope to the left of the highway between the La Haye Saint and the farm of Mont Saint-Jean. On the day of battle, this hollow road, whose existence was in no way indicated, bordering the crest of Mont Saint-Jean, a trench at the summit of the escarpment, a rut concealed in the soil, was invisible, that is to say, terrible. End of Book 1, Chapter 7